all about Robert Indiana yep. and uh, from the Midwest Museum of American Art, of course, as we all know. And so take it away, Randy. All Let's right. Nice well, thank you all uh, for coming today. And as Bill mentioned, my name's Randall Roberts, and I'm the assistant curator for the Midwest Museum of American Art. Uh, just down the road in downtown Elkhart. So if you haven't been there for a while or ever, make it a point this summer to come in uh, and see what we've got going on. And also thank you for sponsoring today's gallery talk. So we'll get right into it. All right. So Robert Indiana, uh, this is the, gonna be the topic of my uh, discussion today. And most people are familiar or know Robert Indiana for love. How many people, you all know love, right? Everybody's seen love. Uh, love was uh, introduced to the public in 1966 as a Christmas card for the Metropolitan Museum and took on its own life from there. But most folks who know about Robert Indiana would never put his name with a piece like this, right? And that's because love has been so reproduced, so done and done and over and over again. Um, it's been translated into four languages and the location span four continents, uh, which there are 38 are in North America, 35 in this country, uh, and the one I think that's most close to where we are at is in Indianapolis. But people don't look at this as a Robert Indiana piece uh, simply because he was a wordsmith. You know, he got to the root of what he was trying to say in a simple graphic expression. And I'll explain more about this later on and give you all the inside information about what each of these squares or diamonds represent. So love is everywhere. It's arguably next to the David, probably the most photographed sculpture in the world. I've had my selfie taken in front of it. So, uh, but the problem with love is that he never copy wrote it. So when he uh, produced this card in 1966, he had no idea of the kind of the birth that it was going to spawn. It, you know, it just took on. Um, its own life and had numerous uh, you know, copies were made, counterfeit items were made uh, because he didn't copyright the love artwork. And because of this, he had this kind of love-hate relationship his whole life with love. You know, he, he really loved love because it made him all of this money, gave him all of this fame. But at the same time, people didn't understand his own artwork because everybody knew him as the creator of love. And then in the 70s, the uh, US postal st system uh, introduced the uh, love stamp, which became the best selling stamp in their entire history, by the way. And at one point, he uh, was in, very interested in collecting each of these items, but there were so many out there in the world that he couldn't keep up uh, with his own inventory that he just ultimately abandoned the project. So they've been made into you know, sneakers, people have tattooed it to themselves, uh, necklaces, rings, paperweights, uh, a floor mat even, uh, which goes for a lot of money in the auction network these days. Uh, love is also rumored to have inspired John Lennon and Paul McCartney's uh, hit from 1967, All You Need Is Love, but that is just a rumor. So Jan, we were just talking about that. And one might also expect that love uh, has some kind of counterculture ideal, uh, the times, time of the era, but it means Nothing, it has nothing to do with that summer of love or any of those things I'd previously talked about. So keeping in mind, Robert Indiana is a wordsmith. He wanted to get down to the root of what he was trying to convey. And love 
It's not about free love. It's not about the summer of love. It's not about the Beatles, the hippies. It is all things in the world that are religious and erotic, the spiritual and the sensual coming together to create one thing. Did anybody know that? Nope. Any close? Anything close? She probably all thought it was about the summer of love and all these simultaneous things happening uh, in the 60s. And because of all of those ha- things happening, people lost, uh, lost the true meaning of what love was all about. And as I had mentioned, he felt trapped by love. You know, it made him all of this money, it gave him all of this fame, but that's all people knew him for. So to read Robert Indiana, it's a visual challenge. There are clues available, but we're never given a complete guide. So in this uh, slide, which is called USA 666, I had introduced earlier, there are a lot of clues in this work of art, but what are they? You know, we might walk up to this, give it maybe three seconds, if that, and probably turn away and say, I don't want to look at this anymore. There's too much to read, uh, to look at. It's not pretty. It's kind of intimidating. Uh, It's got 666 right there in the center. I definitely don't want to be in the same room as that. (laughs) But it's got a great story behind it, I promise. So Robert Indiana was known for using words, numbers, shapes, and colors, and he used these as components, graphical components, to create a visual impact in the sense of a public notice or an announcement to convey precise information at just a glance. So you could think of his work um, as road signs to communicate some kind of a warning to the audience. And his work is characterized by an ironic, encyclical, and sometimes coincidental use of words, dates, numbers, names, events, and places dealing with his subject. And one of the, some of the most important things you need to know about Robert Indiana is that he grew up in a time, uh, the time of roadside America. Uh, so his work is very inspired by, you know, Route 66, this idea of going west, of getting on the highway, total liberation, you know, that the automobile gives to you. And also the fun that can be had in juke, uh, dive bars and roadside restaurants specifically with the pinball machine. Um, And he was also very inspired by this idea of the American dream. You know, we have all got an American dream. Each one is unique to us. But we all know that just when everything is going along just fine, everything's great in the world, it can suddenly, it's over, done, you know. And a lot lot like the pinball machine, you know, when you're playing pinball, you can be ahead, winning, everything's great, and then suddenly the the machine just ends, and it's game over, even though you were winning. Too bad, sorry. So Roadside America and the American Dream, uh, inspired by architecture, road signs, diners, bars, gas stations, Uh, the juke and pinball machines, and also that freedom that the highway gives you moving from one town to the next. So Robert Indiana was part of a new generation of American artists, new as in very radical for their day, uh, in the post-war era whose work defied classification. So Robert Indiana is broadly classified as a pop artist, but he can also be uh, categorized as a hard edge artist, an op artist, and a neo data artist. So it is, what does that mean, right? So in this time, there he is with the master manipulator himself, love him or hate him, Andy Warhol, everyone knows Andy, right? Andy was also a pop artist known for his depiction of Marilyn Monroe. Uh, This is an example of optical art, hard edge art, and then neo-data art. So at the time, all of these painters were making artwork, and they had nothing in common with each other. The only thing that 
the only bonds that they had with each other is that they weren't abstract expressionists. They weren't action painters. They were charting completely new territory by using, you know, items of mass consumer consumerism, of pairing colors together so that when your eyes look at them, it kind of vibrates in a clockwise direction. And sometimes these artists would just go out in the streets and find trash, pick them up, take them back to their studio, and make a work of art from it. So I organized this presentation with uh, three points in mind. And I want to talk about his artwork from his biographical viewpoint that introduces some sort of cautionary tale about the artist's background um, and his family growing up here in Newcastle, Indiana. Also his politics that offer a sober warning. Uh, this is also the kind of thing where the past meets the present and the future. All of these things collide into one piece. And also uh, artwork that has some kind of cynical humor to it based on words and numbers. So his biographical work is layered in coded meaning. It resembles roadside warning signs that predict of an ominous outcome in the quest of finding the American dream and the twists and turns of fate that are associated with that. So everybody is probably aware that Robert Indiana was born in Indiana, in Newcastle, Indiana. Uh, in, Indiana is not his surname, it's actually Clark. Uh, and he was adopted by Carmen and Earl Clark uh, shortly after his birth to his, uh, to his biological parents. And in this painting, uh, this is the only image of his parents that he ever saw in his entire lifetime that where they felt happy, where they expressed some kind of joy in their lifetime, uh, mainly because of the car, their Tin Lizzie, uh, their old Model T that took them from place to place, bar to bar. And if you notice, uh, it reads, a mother is a mother, a father is a father. So even though he was adopted, a mother is still a mother either way, and a father is still a father. He had a very warm uh, relationship with his mother and a very cold relationship with his father. So it's interesting that he depicted, depicted Earl, his father, in a palette of grays as being dull and lifeless and his mother as just <laughs> ebullient. Um, the kind of weird story about this painting uh, is that he imagined he was conceived in this car by his parents, even though he was adopted. So I'll leave it there and let you think of that. It's weird, isn't it? But he was a weird guy. So he was born in 1928 in Newcastle, eventually moved to New York after the war. Uh, he, went to the School of the Art Institute on the GI Bill in Chicago, and then Chicago wasn't big enough, and New York had all the answers um, for his dream to be an artist. So now we get into this kind of work, and this is really what Robert Indiana wanted to be known for, are these kind of sign paintings, these paintings that have this total enigma, this mystery behind them. We don't really know what we're looking at, but there are clues and hidden meanings all throughout. So this is called The Black and Red Diamond American Dream from 1962. A lot like this painting of his parents, it's also a biographical portrait of his parents, believe it or not. And if you look closely, here the word is Jack and Juke, just like uh, the machine and pinball games that his parents would have played, these represent Jack as his father, Juke as his mother, uh, the American dream there, and two is symbolized as his parents and their American dream. 
and the word eat, which apparently, or according to Robert Indiana, was the last word his mother uh, said before she died. Uh, these numbers, where is it? Uh, around, centered around the word US there, 40, 37, 29, and 66 represent uh, various roads that the artist lived on in his childhood. He said, and I get to this later, but by the time he was 17, that he had lived in 21 different houses. His mother got it in her, you know, she was, thought she was very fashionable um, and ahead of her time that she had to have a new house every year. Um, oh, I just thought I was going to say something about, well, I'll get back to it. So arrows, directions, uh, just like the pinball machine and the roadside caution sign. So as promised, here's USA 666. Its most uh, familiar uh, shape is the railroad sign, the railroad crossing sign. And this time, um, even in the 60s, there, you know, having crossing gates wasn't you know, a very common thing, especially in rural areas. You just had to go and hope nothing happened. Um, this is also a portrait of his father. Uh, just not in the uh, representational form. So his father, at one point early in his life, worked for the railroad, uh, was one of six children, was born in the sixth month of the year, which was June, and went west on Route 66, and then died in 1966, which was the death of his American dream. So, of course, USA, 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 eat the last word his mother said before she died. And because he uh, and her relationship was affectionate, you have the word hug. And him and his father's relationship was not so affectionate, you err on the side of caution. And there he is in his studio cutting out a stencil. And you can say, see the USA uh, 666 piece in the background, along with eat and die. So now we move into his political work. And his political work spoke of its own time. It too questioned the American dream and carried a message for the future. It's often cyclical and ironic occurrences where the past, the present, and the future all collide into one piece. Uh, this piece uh, is owned by the museum uh, part, uh, as a part of the decade series he produced in 1971 based on the painting Mississippi from 1965. So this is just one of four pieces that he did in 1965 to commemorate the centennial of the end of the Civil War. Uh, this was, of course, the Civil Rights era, the height of it, right in the thick of all the action. And these are the four, four of the original seven secessionist states. So he did one for Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, and Florida. Each of them read, just as in the anatomy of man, every nation must have its hind part. And in the center of the bullseye is each of the states, and each state has a town listed. In this case, it's uh, Mississippi is Philadelphia, Louisiana is Bugalusa, Alabama is Selma, Florida, there's no city highlighted. The point of this is he was referencing all of these places that were notorious for racial um, inequity and all of that kind of action that happened, voter suppression. Voter suppression uh, that was happening in the 60s. And the real irony is it's still happening. So it was happening in 1865, it's happening in 1965, and it's still happening today. The other big takeaway, when you think of all of that stuff, you think of places like Selma, maybe Bugalusa, I'd never heard of that before. 
um, in the whole state of Florida. But when you hear the place or the town called Philadelphia, I think of the city of brotherly love. I think of Pennsylvania, you know, Yankees, where that doesn't happen in Mississippi, but it did. You guys enjoy it so far? Yes. All right. Yes. All right, and then in, also happening in 1965, um, a divorced man has never been the president. And then flash forward, here we are. So it's a, a real uh, political commentary on do these things, I mean, is it really necessary to, uh, how do I wanna say this, if you, if you have a public life, a very public life, should all of your private matters be so public? Does it really matter or does it or should it? So in 1965, no one had ever ran for president who had been divorced, but Nelson Rockefeller did. He was uh, centering the uh, Republican nomination and ultimately lost, forget to who, I don't remember. Um, but I just thought it was a real interesting coincidence that here we are in the future and we've been there, done that now. This one's a really great one. We have this one on permanent display at the museum. Um, it's called The Golden Future of America from 1976. And this one is hands down probably my favorite piece in the collection, maybe number two, and also the number one piece that uh, most visitors just walk right by because, again, there's too much to look at. There's too many colors. I don't want to read. I just want to look at something pretty. And that's okay. That's fine. Because... For a long time, I didn't look at this either. I just walked right by it until I started reading more about Robert Indiana. Uh, so this piece, like any other piece, you have to digest, and you really need to start from the outside and work your way in. Uh, but in 1976, of course, that's a centennial year for this country. So everybody's celebrating everything's great in this country, everything's wonderful, you know, it's the great American everything. So Robert Indiana decided to make his own great American print. Full of cynicism though. And if you've already figured it out, don't, don't squeal it out. So it goes back to Benjer, Be Benjamin Franklin, uh, who in 1776 proclaimed that in free government, the rulers are the servants and the people are their sovereigns. I remember hearing that as a young child growing up thinking the same thing. And then when I got a job and had to pay taxes, I realized that's just not the case. We all know that, right? So knowing that now, if you notice the arrows are going in a clockwise direction, a lot like the pinball machine. You notice though that USA doesn't read clockwise or left, well I guess it, yeah, it goes backwards, not left to right like normal Western reading goes. You can interpret that in your own way. I'm gonna not speak on that. He could be saying uh, the country is going at a backwards rate from 1776, because in 1876, another centennial year, another golden moment in American history, uh, the Reconstruction era, uh, but it wasn't golden for everybody. There were still issues, people were suffering, but the country was moving ahead. That was what was important. The same in 1976, uh, you know, we're still get, dealing with the civil rights issues, with women's issues, um, everybody's issues in general, but this is a centennial year. We're going ahead. We're not going to think about that. So what does 2076 have left in store for us? And I thought it was interesting 
<laughs> that the fonts are different from, seven, from 18 and 1976. It's a sleeker, more futuristic uh, looking font. Any questions so far? Okay. Did you explain the letters? No. Okay. No. <laughs> so now the big takeaway is, so you know all that, we're not in charge of the government. Um, you know the eye of providence right here. We've all seen those in the dollar bills. We carry those around with us in our wallets. If we still have cash. This eye follows you everywhere you go. And just like that eye of providence, the people who are in charge of you is the FBI, the CIA, and everybody's favorite, the IRS. So now after seeing some of these works, can't you relate to, you know, being... If you made love and then you made all of these other fantastic artworks, wouldn't you feel the same way too? Like it totally overshadowed and dominated your whole artistic career. Great piece, so you got to see it in person. Is that a lithograph? Or a uh, all of his work started out as original paintings, and then he was so. Uh, he, he w couldn't give them up. He couldn't give them away. What's the word? He was so um, possessive of them that he decided he'd make prints of them instead so they were easier to give out and, of course, make more money. Yep. Um, what, how large is the original? Yeah. Uh, the painting, it's probably about 20 by 24, and then the prints are 18. This print is about 18 by 24. So not very large, they're pretty portable, um, you know, small enough to reproduce easily. So yes, all of them start out as paintings and then they get reproduced as either lithographs or silk screens uh, by the artist in his studio. So are they numbered? All of the prints should be additioned, um, signed and additioned, and whatever the number is. So if it's not signed or in, in a very small edition of no bigger than 150, I would be suspect, especially um, any work produced by his studio in the 1990s. There's a lot of issues uh, centering around his studio at that time period of producing, mass producing material that were, was reproduced without his permission. So, and if it doesn't bear, bear a copyright logo, you know, he got smart after love, the mishap with love, that everything became copywritten at that point. Again, that's the real kind of issue with him is he's such a cynical person. Like he, like love, you know, he was happy that it made him all this money, but at the same time, it didn't make him enough money. You know, it gave him too much fame. It overshadowed this, it overshadowed. So he was never a happy person to begin with. Uh, it's hard to say. I, I'm sure he would have wanted people to know what it meant. Oh, no, no, this, a lot of this was all discovered later by art historians and specifically uh, Marty Krauss from Indianapolis. Um, I just lost my train of thought. But a lot of this work, sorry, what I was going to say, uh, I, it's hard to say because a lot of it could have put him in jail at the time if people really knew what this stuff meant, especially the uh, Nelson Rockefeller piece, because how dare you, well, even this piece, question the government. I mean, this is the Vietnam era. People were just coming out of the shell and wakening up to what was really happening in the world. Um, so it's hard to say. 
Do you have a question? The thing that's like screaming at me is this was done in 1976, but it doesn't have 1776 anywhere in it. And yeah, it's the golden future of America, but still, I feel like I'm look. I'm searching for a way to come up with the number 17 somehow in that. Oh, you know? well, that just refers to quoting Benjamin Franklin. I guess, I guess yeah, that's, that's the reference. There. Yeah. yeah, so the date is there. It's just not there. Yeah. You just, you know, all of these works or these signs, they're just clues. You have to link all of these together. Uh, like a puzzle and put it the works together. So a lot of it is very interpretive uh, I mean there are very factual things about it, but there are also things that can be interpreted too like USA being backwards. That's just an interpretation But this is a very definite literal fact the CIA the FBI are IRS Uh, also, in 1963, he created this uh, roadside painting called Yield Brother uh, for the Bertrand Russell nuclear disarmament campaign. Uh, a lot of folks see right away, you see the peace sign. There's four peace signs. Uh, the peace sign historically is also representative of nuclear disarmament. So if you hold the flags this way and then this way it makes the peace sign uh, and then there are four like a four-way stop with yield signs you have to stop at the yield sign it's not a suggestion so we all need to stop or yield for peace Yeah, and there he is in his studio uh, painting signs for different theaters and campaigns. Then he got into uh, producing posters. Uh, he did one for the South Bend Museum when they opened in the 70s. So he's kind of like Andy Warhol in that way of a mass producer, a manipulator, you know, never happy. He always had an ulterior motive, so although they despised each other, and that's the irony of that, because they both wanted the fame, they both wanted the power, and ultimately Andy Warhol won. So numbers and word games, his work can also be a light-hearted light critique delivered as a joke or a pun that incorporates numbers and words that have some sort of special meaning especially in numerism. In this particular work that's coming up, there are numerical reoccurrences uh, that he uses. And as I mentioned before, uh, the fact that he lived in 21 homes by the age of 17 along you know, these routes had really you know, put a hold on him. That really changed him in a way. So it gripped him since his childhood. which le leads to uh, this painting called The Metamorphosis of Norma Jean Mortison. So everybody knows Marilyn Monroe. And when she died in 1962, 62, this wave of sentiment and remorse went around the country. You know, every artist, was every pop artist was eulogizing her in some way uh, you know, as this, this goddess of the screen. But Indiana waited for almost six years before he did his own uh, painting of Marilyn. And six is a very kind of mystical number in this painting that's related to Marilyn Monroe uh, and also him, the artist himself. And I'm going to read this this paragraph about it because even if I paraphrase it I can't do it justice and I definitely can't memorize it uh, but we have the caution sign so we need to hear this story and go forward with caution in our own lives so the mystical numbers 
they play upon the numer numerological combinations that have always attracted the artist. Six, but six divided by two, 26, the year of her birth, so she was born in 1926. 62, the year of her death, so they're just inverted. At two, she was almost suffocated by a hysterical neighbor. At six, a member of her 12 foster family, so six times two, tried to rape her. In 1952, which is 26 plus 26, when she was 26, she first starred in a dramatic role, and in the first week at the Manhattan box office, the film grossed $26,000. Death came by her hand on the sixth day of August, the eighth month, six plus two. Indiana was also intrigued, he said, by the metamorphosis of her real name into her Hollywood name. Through the addition of three letters and the subtraction of three others, six again, these letters are set in bands of gray in the painting. So you see Norma Jean Mortison and Marilyn Monroe there, and then 26 right there in the center. The faithful numbers, six and two, and the letters of both names centered in small circles take the shape of a rotary phone, the instrument she held as she died. It surrounds the stylized image of the dream girl painted in cosmetic colors against a golden star whose tips, the tips of the star, seem to mock the dreams by pointing out I moon. <laughs> Would you have ever, have got, ever guessed that, just looking at it? So it's, it's just full of just all kinds of hidden meaning, of layers, of codes, you know, a rotary phone, uh, 26, dying in 62, and whether it's coincidence or not, these are things that he found very important to him as an artist to communicate that message with because I don't think about this stuff and I think there's a fair chance no one else in this room thinks about it either. So it's nice to have this pointed out to you so when you're just buzzing by that Robert Indiana work on the wall, now you know there's something, something to gain from it deeper than just love. But you know, all things love are spiritual and erotic. That makes love. And his favorite number uh, was number two because it takes two people to make love. The black and white love. His least favorite number was zero because zero equals death. Uh, by the late 70s, he had fled New York. He was done with it. He felt like he had been betrayed by gallerist Leo Stein and Andy Warhol himself. Um, and he moved to the island of Vinyl Haven off the coast of Maine, where he went into self-imposed exile, or exile because he felt he was being black by, blackballed by the New York art scene. So this is the outside of his home and studio, which was an old uh, Masonic lodge, which is sort of interesting because the, the Masons are, you know, very mysterious people. It happens behind closed doors. And then that eye of providence. There should be an eye somewhere up there. Uh, when the Iraq war started, he covered all of the windows with the flag paintings. Uh, and that's really where he got to be kind of very awkward and secluded from the rest of the world. There are stories uh, from journalists and different curators and art dealers who tried to make contact with him that they couldn't just, you know, knock on the door anymore. Uh, they were given a message from uh, through the mail slot to call this number, let it ring three times. If you don't pick up, or if somebody picks up, you hang up, then call back again and leave a message on the machine. So he's complicated, <laughs> you know, and then, he, and then he has a problem, like the older he gets, you know, he becomes more lonely, but 
at the same time, he doesn't want anybody around him or he's always bothered by people. So he's just a real strange personality, but a genius in his artwork. So I guess that's what it takes to, you know, sometimes be smarter than your own good. Uh, this is the inside of his home and studio. He still retained all of the original elements of the, of the lodge, but flooded it with his own personal collection of his artwork. And then right here in the background is his own self-portrait. And there he is as an older man. This would be about probably 2015, just before he died in 2018. Uh, and when he died in 2018, he was having some memory problems. Uh, There's trouble with his estate and issues with people uh, who worked in his studio uh, that have been, charges have been brought against them for forgery and mismanagement, taking advantage of this guy, uh, basically making a profit uh, of, off of his name uh, for work that didn't belong to them. So there was recently a, a book was published uh, by Bob Keats, I believe it was, called The Isolation Artist. So if you're interested in reading more about the problems with Robert Indiana's estate, I would recommend getting that book. When did it move to Maine? Uh, it was in the late 70s, I believe in 79. So you lived there for about 40 years. Oh, yeah. Self-imposed isolation, just making his own artwork. But there were other personal legal problems in the 80s that he had uh, with people on the island who didn't really like him or want his celebrity there and felt like he had changed the whole town. Uh, and some very personal things that he had gotten himself involved with. Uh, and basically lost a bunch of money. And that's when he started reproducing artwork in the 90s that is now looked back at as questionable because there just are too many issues involved with that. So I wouldn't buy one if you ever find one. I'd just let that one go. So he's cranky, stubborn, uh, egotistical, set in his own ways, his way or the highway. So you can imagine why him and Warhawk were always at odds because they both wanted it their way. Uh, his first career retrospective was in 2013. Can you believe that? You've been active since the late 50s in New York, and this is 2013 is the first time you're getting any real world attention. Warhol's already gotten shows, Lichtenstein, Ellsworth Kelly, uh, who was his lover, by the way. They've all had their big heyday, but not him. So he was pretty upset, and that's again one of the reasons why he decided to leave New York and go out to the wilderness or the island. And in this show uh, love was not included by the artist that was the whole deal uh, because this the rest of this this is my life's work. Love is just you know, uh, a side piece. It's just the thing I'm known for. But this is what I want you to know me for. So one, two, three, four, and then in the back, eat and die that we talked about earlier. Randy, do you know anything about the one, two, three, four? I mean, it's not area. Oh, each, well, I'm not going to go back, but each number has a specific meaning. I don't know the specific meanings for each number other than two was his favorite because it equals love and zero was death. But all of them have a specific meaning behind it. I would encourage you to get the book. There's a great book about um, all of his artwork uh, by Abrams, or you could probably Google it too, come up with something. So most importantly, Indiana is remembered as a people's painter, and he really laid the foundation for many contemporary artists, especially now, 
uh, who work in text or use text in their artwork, um, as well as media artists and activist artists as well. So if you go back, it's crazy to think, you know, all of these signs that he painted, he's already used all of these things that we look at in the world today as normal, he's already done it. And that's all I have to say about Robert Indiana. <laughs> <laughs>